Well, good morning, Coastal Community Church. How are y'all this morning? My name is Bill. My wife, Dottie, and I volunteer at Canaveral Port Ministry on Mondays and Fridays. I'm a, a chaplain. She cooks and washes bottles and runs a store and does all that sweaty stuff. Uh, I have the easy job. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Tracy and the church here for inviting me here today. I want to thank the music team. Uh, we did not collaborate on the songs that are being sung this morning or have been sung in my message to you this morning, but we might as well have. We know who did the collaboration on that. And so uh, I want to first start off by... Uh, telling you just briefly about myself and, and Dottie. We're retired school teachers uh, from Oklahoma. Shout out to the school teacher there. Uh, where uh, We were members and involved at the First Baptist Church in Westville, Oklahoma, which is a small town on the eastern side in the foothill, foothills of the Ozark Mountains. Uh, we moved to Cape Canaveral shortly after I retired in 2011, and the place we bought and where we continue to live is basically right across the street from uh, the ministry there at, at Port Canaveral. And we didn't realize that at the time, had no idea. We didn't know it so when we moved. One day I told Dottie, I said, that looks like something the Southern Baptist would do. I'm going to go investigate. And I did, and sure enough, it was something that the Southern Baptists do. And we became involved, started volunteering there. And through the connections that we made there, uh, I eventually became uh, the pastor at King Street Baptist Church in Coco for two and a half years. And after that, Dottie and I went to Maine uh, for 11 months where I interim pastored at Livingstone Community Church in Standish, Maine, which is just outside of Portland. And both of those pastoring experiences were great experiences for us. And since then, I've had the opportunity to have preached in many churches here in Brevard County and in churches back in Oklahoma and in Arkansas, in Kansas, in Utah, and in Maine, and even had a wonderful opportunity to do a tent revival in Gorham, Maine last fall. I don't even remember the last time I was at a tent revival, but we had one in Gorham, Maine last fall. Still our hearts is at Canaveral Port Ministry. It's a place that we always come back to. Every time I go, I go with the intention of trying to be a blessing to those people. And every time I leave, without exception, I'm the one who has received the blessing. Proverbs 11.25 is my is my seafarer's ministry verse. It's the one that I claim. It's the one I share with people. And it, it reads differently in different ways. But in uh, the version uh, that I use, it reads this way. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And I'm a testimony to, the, to that verse being true. So on behalf of our director, Mark Wodka. He's the big tall guy. The rest of the staff and volunteers and the over 45,000 visits representing 107 countries, including 1,638 first-time visitors made by seafarers this past year from the cruise and cargo ships that are now coming into Port Canaveral virtually every day. I want to thank... Coastal Community Church here in Port St. John for your long time and continued partnership with the ministry. Your spiritual support throughout the years, your prayers uh, for the, the staff and the volunteers and those people there. Some of you may be those secret prayer partners that we have where a seafarer can put the prayer request in the box and it goes out to our secret prayer Partners who may never come to the ministry, but they're praying. And if you'd like to be a part of that, come see me after the service. That's a wonderful ministry opportunity. 
not just your spiritual support, but your physical support. Every third Saturday, under the direction of Allison and Ray Kurtza, you all provide lunch for the ministry. And folks, I'm here to tell you, those 100-pound Filipinos can pack away the rice. I go through the line, and I don't have any rice, and they'll say, you're not eating rice? And I say, no, carbs. And they all say, no rice, no power. They get their energy to work those 16, 17, 18 hour days from that rice. So thank you guys for doing not just that, but other physical presence over there. Uh, I know Cassie Ruiz uh, came this summer and was our package girl, even when she tore her ACL or whatever she did to her knee. She's limping around there, hauling packages around. So, so thank you guys for that. And thank you for your financial support. It takes finances, it takes money to do what we do. And Coastal Community has been a consistent, dedicated giver to the ministry throughout the years. So thank you very much. Rest assured, it does not go unnoticed, it does not go unappreciated. Most of you, I think, have an idea of what goes on over there, but if you've never been there, if you haven't been there recently, there have been a lot of changes going on. Uh, used to, when you walked in, there was like 50 computers there. We don't have those anymore. We've got like four computers, because everybody's got a phone now. And so we've been able to free up that space. we moved the pool table from here to there. This is where the pool table was. has become a big meeting room. The brand new kitchen is very much appreciated. Uh, can, the, the little bitty kitchen that they used to cook in, I don't know how they did it. I still don't know how they did it. That's why I don't go to the kitchen. But the, the idea that, that there's always change going on there. And, and, and the ministries that go on there are always kind of changing too. We do offer places where they can have a package uh, delivered and it, you know it's going to be safe there and that's what Cassie did this summer uh, we've got a we've got a ministry now where they can send money back home without having to go somewhere else to do it and be charged some exorbitant fee uh, we offer free Wi-Fi so they can so they can connect with their families back home we run shuttle buses to and from not just the port uh, that their ship is in or the the, the uh, terminal that their ship is in but also to Walmart, TJ Maxx, BJ's, the mall, Ross's, so they can go shopping all without charge. Of course, we have the meal uh, for them. Uh, and, and you guys that are involved in that on the third Saturday, you know what that entails. And, and uh, those are all wonderful things. This morning in the early service, I mentioned that we have a clothes closet. And... You know, people donate clothing and they can come and, and take something they like and there's no charge to it. But one of the more popular things is stuffed animals. Those seafarers love those stuffed animals. They take them home to their kids. Or they're their companions on a ship. And after the service, one lady came up to me, gave me her address and her phone number, and she says, I've got a bunch of stuffed animals I want to donate to you. And so all of that, it, guys, all of that is greatly appreciated. All of the effort, all of the prayers, all of the times. I cannot tell you how much that, that what people like you are doing here is appreciated by the people there. And I never really realized it until this January. I heard him say thank you before, but this January just drove that point home. This January, an earthquake hit the Philippines. And our Filipino brothers and sisters, they were all, you know, upset, trying to find out how their families were doing back home and all that. Well, I'm standing in line about 9.30 in the morning waiting to go to the bathroom. That line to the bathroom is right next to the line that's picking up packages. 
And here's this Filipino guy. I never met him. I do not know his name to this day. I've never seen him again. I wouldn't know him if I did see him. He's talking on the phone. He's got earplugs in. And I hear him say this in, the, in an obvious response to the question, where are you? His response was, I'm at the seafarer's ministry, the greatest place on earth. Now, he was oblivious to me. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know what I was doing. And I heard him say that, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and we just fist bumped each other. And he summed it all up. He summed up what that place meant to him. The seafarer's ministry, the greatest place on earth. And we hear that sentiment all the time. We hear thank yous every day. It reminds me of when Jesus is teaching in Matthew 25, 35, and he says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a strange stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. <clears throat> Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when, when, when did we do all those things? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, <coughs> whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I needed a place where my package would be safe until I could pick it up. I needed a place where I could send money back home to my family. I needed a place where I could have access to the internet so I could make sure my family back home was okay. And you did that for me. And that just that, those verses really drive the point home for me about the accomplishments that we do over there at the ministry in the name of Jesus. Of course, the purpose of the ministry, the very reason the ministry exists, the reason we do what we do, is to share the good news about Jesus with as many seafarers as possible. That they may come to know Him as Savior and Lord, <clears throat> Excuse me, and that those who do know Him will grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus as we disciple them. In the past year, <clears throat> two seafarers have been baptized, 303 have made professions of faith, 2,846 Bibles, 1,237 Jesus DVDs have been distributed. And I cannot tell you, I, there's no way to keep count of this, but I cannot tell you how many of these little Gospels of John and how many of these little Bible studies, here's one in English, here's one in Spanish, we have one in Tagalog too, I cannot tell you how many of these have gone out the door back onto the ships, and hopefully to the Philippines, Indonesia, Mexico, Constantinople, and Timbuktu. They go like hotcakes. We get Krispy Kremes donated. We stick these little Gospels of John back with the Krispy Kremes. We'll say, take the Krispy Kremes and make sure you pick up a Gospel of John. And there have been some days, there have been more of these gone out than the Krispy Kremes. So it's, 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 it, it's why we do what we do. And, and so, you know, right now I want to kind of make a plug for the Walk with Bibles. Most of you all are familiar with that. That's what we do uh, once a year to raise money to buy Bibles and other Christian literature. But the idea is that they can have something in their own language. The joy of seeing a girl from Japan get a Bible in Japanese, oh, that's an awesome feeling to watch that, to, to see that. English Bibles and, and Spanish Bibles, they're not very expensive, but I had the privilege of giving away a Bible in Nepali this spring. That's the language of Naples, uh, Nepal, not Naples, that's in Italy, Nepal, that's in Asia, of Nepal. One of the Bibles that the Walk for Bibles Drive bought is now in the Himalayan mountains. 
I had another uh, guy that wanted a Bible in Romanian. And so he took a Bible in Romanian. And then he said, and he never came to chapel. He never, he never expressed any spiritual interest at all. And the day he left, he said, I've been sitting here listening to the songs of the chapel. He said, do you have a book those are in? So not only did he take a Romanian Bible back to Romania, he took a Baptist hymnal back to Romania. And they have a Baptist hymnal now in their house. He said his wife wanted the Psalms. Anyway, the, the Walk for Bibles is this Saturday at, at the port. The, the gathering place is First Baptist Church, Cape Canaveral, which is just right down Atlantic from the ministry. And you're invited to come and walk with us. It's kind of a happening over there. I meant to bring one of the shirts. There's these bright kind of neon, yellowish, greenish, whatever color it is shirts. People are wearing these shirts. They're walking all around. They've raised money to to support the walk, and uh, there's people everywhere. And I've actually had people just on the street, not involved with the ministry, not involved with the walk, say, hey, what's going on? Tell them that, and they'll say, here's a 10 or here's a 20 to support this. So it's really a cool thing. I think they have hot dogs at the end of it and things like that. But, but if you would like to come and support the ministry this Saturday for the Walk for Bibles, your support would be greatly appreciated. You can go online at www.cpm.life. You can pick up literature in the back. I'll be back there at the end of the service. And uh, again, everybody is welcome. If you can't come, but you've never been over there, or maybe it's been a long time since you have, I, I want to I invite everybody. I want to invite everybody in the room to come and visit us, to this, to this place, this gathering place where people from virtually every nation and tribe and people and language, thank you, brother, <clears throat> and language gather. Try to come between like 9-ish and noon, because that's when it's really happening. That's when people are coming and going. Bring the kids. Bring the grandparents. Bring your neighbors. Show them the world. Literally gathered right there in one place. You don't even have to leave Brevard County to do it. Brevard County, the world has come to you. I've got friends from all over the world. I didn't say this in the first. Where's Tracy at? Is he here? I was going to say he heard the first sermon. He may have left. Uh, a couple years ago, I had cancer treatment. Guys, do you know what it means to have people from all over the world praying for you? I had prayer partners in Mexico, Zimbabwe, Malaysia, uh, all over because of meeting these people there. People who are very much believers in Jesus. So it's a cool place I was telling a, a fellow out back, it's one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of in my life. And I've been a part of a lot of cool things. But it's really a cool place. So just come visit. Tell them Bill sent you, okay? And uh, they'll know who I am. On, on the days I volunteer, I always give a brief explanation of the gospel from the podium in that big meeting room. That's the one time you have them all gathered there. And, and you can't make them listen to you. But they're at least there, and you're at least here with the microphone. And, 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 and you kind of have a captive audience. One day this summer, I was speaking. Unbeknownst to me, a young lady from Argentina was drinking in every word. I believe you all have had Josh Palmer here from our ministry before. Josh and Mark noticed this young lady was really locked into what I was saying. And, and at the end of those times, I always say, if you want to know more about Jesus, come and see me. And, and, and come and get one of these little booklets written by a friend of Jesus named John. And the reason he wrote this book is that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. 
Well, afterwards, she came up and got one of these little books, and I asked where she was from, and she said Argentina. Well, it just so happens, we know that that's not true, that nothing just so happens, but it just so happens that on Fridays, we have a man who is from Argentina, who is a chaplain, who comes to, to speak to our Spanish-speaking people. Long story short, I introduce her to him. He takes her into one of the offices, and an hour later, she's a professing believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, you can't make that up. That, that's, just, that's just too good. That's just good, good stuff. And that's why we are there. That's what we live for there. I always share the gospel in some form or other, without exception. I figure if this is going to be the only time those folks ever hear me speak, I want it to be what the Scripture says is of first importance. The Apostle Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, wrote these words in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And they've always been my guide wherever I speak, whether it be at the seafarers or the churches here in Brevard County or throughout the United States. <clears throat> in the ESV, they read this way. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When those, when those verses were given to me by the Lord in my calling eight years ago, I was reading the message where the verses read this way. You'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's master stroke, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. You see, the sad reality is this. Not just in the United States, but all over the world, there are so many people who are not believers. There are so many people who have never heard the gospel of Jesus. There are many people who may have heard the gospel of Jesus, but rejected it. There are many people who have heard about Jesus, but it's a distorted view of Jesus. While some may deny his existence altogether, others may think of him as just another religious fellow, like Moses or Mohammed or Confucius or the Buddha. Some may even have, a, just like here in the United States, some may even have a form of cultural or political or national Christianity but that doesn't translate into them having a saving faith in Jesus or with them having a personal relationship with Him. So I share with them the Jesus as told to us from the Bible. Here He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here He's the Messiah, the Anointed One. Here... He is not just a way, He's the way. Here He's not just a truth, He's the truth. And here He's not just a life, He is the life. And here we are told, no one, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's this Jesus who is fully and totally God, the visible image of the invisible God, always existing before the beginning of heaven and earth. For by Him and for Him and through Him all things were created. Things in heaven and things on earth. Things visible and things invisible. All things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. He's the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact representation of God's being. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the A and the Z. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He's the one who was, 
who is and who is to come. It's this Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of a human. It's this Jesus who left the bliss and comfort of heaven, the joy of perfectly loving and being perfectly loved, to come to this earth to live the life that is the total and complete contrast of that. A sorrowful life. A despised life, rejected by the very men and women He created. He instead became acquainted with grief. A man of sorrows. The Son of God becoming human. That we might become the children of God. <clears throat> it is this Jesus who indeed became human. One of us. Emmanuel. God with us. And not just any human, but a human in the most humblest of forms. A helpless baby born in the, to the remotest of mothers a young teenage virgin girl named Mary, in the remotest of places, a barn, in the remotest of towns, Bethlehem, in the remotest of nations, Israel, in the remotest of times, 2,000 years ago. It is this Jesus, the true and better Adam, who was made like us in every way, living the life we were created to live but didn't, with God not just as our Creator, but as our Father, as our loving Heavenly Father. He has always loved us, we say. Jesus always loved the Father. He all oh, this is a mind blower to me. Jesus has always loved his Father with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind, all of his strength. And he's always loved his neighbor as himself, even to the point of loving his enemies. And he did that, that he might become the merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might be qualified to make atonement for our sins. Because he himself suffered, he is able to help us when we are tempted. For in him we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet is without sin. You see, it's this Jesus who indeed, indeed lived a sinless life, a lamb unblemished and spotless. He never missed the mark. That's what sin is, missing the mark. The archer shooting there, the word picture is the archer shooting there and missing the target. He never missed the mark. What's the mark? The glory of God. He never came short of the glory of God, ever. He lived in total and complete obedience and reverence and worship to God. It's this Jesus who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God to cleanse our conscience of acts that lead to death so that we might fulfill the purpose for which we were created by Him, to serve and glorify and love the living God and live as His beloved children. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave Himself as a ransom for all men, Fulfilling the very reason He came to this earth He Himself created. Not to be served, but to serve. And to give His life as a ransom for many. Seeking and saving those who are lost. It's this Jesus who was obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's this Jesus who paid a debt he did not owe because we owe a debt we can never pay. It's this Jesus who died the death we should have to die but now don't have to because while the wages of our sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord 
Jesus Christ. It's this Jesus who knew no sin that we might become, who became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. For while we were sinners and enemies of God, this Jesus did the unthinkable. Christ died for us. And die he did. Nobody ever died more than Jesus. This idea that he swooned, he wasn't really dead. Guys, Jesus died. Nobody ever died more. Outstretched arms, hands nailed to an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. It is at this cross that God demonstrates his love that we sang about. Most demonstrably was at the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever Filipino Indonesian, Mexican, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Port St. John, Port St. Lucie, Port Canaveral, Utah, Maine, man, woman, black, brown, white, rich, poor. Is there any more ways us humans can divide ourselves? Here's the Lord saying, whosoever, don't matter, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's at this cross of this Jesus that God shows us most his mercy and his grace and his love. Everything he wants us to know about him, everything God wants us to know about him comes together at the cross beams of Mount Calvary. Have you ever been loved like that? Have you ever experienced that kind of love? If they're going to take you out here in the middle of the neighborhood and hang you, and Jesus said, No way, I'll take his place. I'll take place wouldn't you call that love but the story of the Jesus of the Bible doesn't end at the cross as dead as dead ever was the slow agonizing death of crucifixion we get our word excruciating from that word okay it's the same root word excruciating that's slow agonizing, painful death. Women think childbirth. Men think a head cold. Excruciating. Okay? And then the finality of death with a spear thrust in his side. He was taken from that cross and laid in a tomb for what was thought to be his final resting place by both foe and friend alike. But out of the tomb he came, for God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And just as the cross shows us God's amazing, overwhelming love for us, the empty tomb shows us God's overwhelming power and the proof that Jesus is who he said he was and did what he said he did and does what he says he does and will do what he says he will do. We see that most dramatically when up from the grave he arose. <clears throat> and in raising Jesus from the dead, God has exalted him to the highest place. And given him the name that is above every name. 
that at the name of this Jesus, heaven has ordained that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is what the Bible says is of utmost importance. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. The story of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is not some fairy tale. It's not some poetic way His followers, you know, kind of dressed Him up to be more than just another guy. They never expected Him to raise from the dead. They were the most shocked ones at all of all. Think of Thomas. I won't believe unless I see it. I mean, seriously. We're talking about a guy that was crucified, spirited. I don't even think that's a word. Spirited? Speared. And then three days later, it's like nothing happened. Except he's got a couple scars. They never expected it, yet they experienced it. Right after the verses of utmost importance, it says he he appeared first to Peter, and then the twelve, and then he appeared to over 500 at one time. One of the things I taught when I taught school was U.S. government. I taught the Constitution of the United States. Article 3 of the Constitution of the United States says there are so many witnesses required to convict somebody of treason in these United States? The answer to that is two. And the Bible says there's over 500 people that saw the resurrected Jesus at the same time. There's not a court in the United States that wouldn't take that as irrefutable evidence that this Jesus was alive. They heard, this is their testimony, by the way, they heard with their own ears his sweet voice. They saw with their own eyes his nail-scarred hands. They touched with their own hands his spirit's pierced side. And over a a period of 40 days after his suffering, according to the first chapter of Acts, he showed himself to them many times, convincing them, giving them many convincing proofs they were alive, that he was alive. And then on the 40th day, that 40th day after his resurrection, he ascended into the heavens right before their very eyes, where he currently, right now, while we're sitting right here, he currently sits at the right hand of the Father, but he's not just sitting there biding time. He's interceding for us. And he's preparing a place for us with the promise that this same Jesus would one day come back to the earth in the same way they saw him go up. But next time, not as a little baby away in a manger, and not as a sacrificial lamb on an old rugged cross, but as a victorious warrior, riding a white horse, the Lion of Judah. Even so, so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So this is who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. And this is what He did. Living, He loved us. Dying, He saved us. Buried, He carried our sins far away. Rising, He justified freely, and forever and one day he's coming oh glorious day you see his conquering of death is good news for us today because his tomb's still empty and this jesus is still alive and salvation and glory and power belong to our god and it is this good news the gospel of jesus christ which is the power of god that brings salvation to everyone who believes. For to all who receive Him, 
and believe on his name, he gives them the right to be called the children of God. That's the Jesus we present at Canaveral Port Ministry. And we're not ashamed of that gospel. We want every one of those seafarers to know him in this personal way of salvation where they can know God, not just as God, but as Father. One of the greatest blessings I ever had was a year and a half after I discipled a group of Colombian ladies. One of the girls came back on a different ship. And she introduced me to her new friends who I had never met. This is Bill. He's the one that taught me that God is my father. We had gone over the Lord's Prayer. How did Jesus teach us to pray? Our Father, which art in heaven. You know why he taught us to pray that way? Because that's how he knows us, the Father. He didn't call you God. He says, my father. And that's why he wants you to know God. And that's why I came. That's why he said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the father but by me because nobody else knew him as the father but Jesus. My favorite way to, to end there at the podium at, at, at the port is the story of Paul at Athens. Here he is in the city of Athens. There's all these religious people. And you've got to understand, guys, a lot of those people that come in to our ministry are religious. I mean, they're more religious than we are. They're very religious. Those Muslims, I mean, Dottie can tell you, and, and you guys that do the lunch, that you all tell too. You got you to tell them whether it's pork or beef because a lot of those people aren't going to eat pork. And a lot of those Hindus aren't going to eat beef because they're religious. But they don't have the relationship with the Father. And so here we are in Athens 2,000 years ago, and Paul is distressed because all of these idols and all of this religion, they even have one to the unknown God. And so he preaches about Jesus. And he says, the ultimate proof that this man is who he was, was that God raised him from the dead. That's how he ended the sermon. The sermon was about Jesus to religious people. Imagine that. And the response of the Athenians is the response I get everywhere I go, whether it be Maine, Oklahoma, Utah, or at the ministry. Three responses to Paul's message of the gospel. Some scoffed when you talked about the dead being raised. Some said, I want to hear more. And some believed. And that's the three responses. And so the question for us today is, where do I fit in there? What's my reaction to the old, old story of Jesus? Is, the, is it the old, old story that never grows old? And each time you hear it, it's more wonderfully sweet? Or has it become mundane and boring and ritualistic do you scoff do you want to hear more i'm interested that's why pastor tracy and and the and the people here are here that's why this church exists they'd love to share with you more about this jesus and who he is and what he did and so you know ask yourself what is my response to hearing the story of jesus and if you're a believer and you love the old, old story of, of, of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love, and it's more wonderfully sweet every time you hear it, ask yourself this question. What am I doing to make it known more? Guys, don't package that into some box that it has to look like this. If you'd like to come out to the ministry, 
and volunteer in any way, bus driver. We got van drivers that win more people than chaplains. Okay, I mean, because they got a captive audience. You get on their van, they're preaching, right? But it doesn't have to look just one particular way. It can be by declaring with our mouth, but it can also be by demonstrating with our life. I had a lady come up to me today and she says, can I get one of those? I said, sure. I said, I can get you a lot more than one of those. You know how many seeds are sown with the Gospel of John? Do your neighbors have one? Do your relatives? Do your friends? Don't, don't package what making Jesus known more looks like to this little box. Because it's not packaged. It looks tremendously different than anything I ever dreamed about. On behalf of uh, Mark and the guys at the port and the guys and gals at the port, thank you for having me, Tracy. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to be right out there at the table after the service. If <clears throat> you'd like to come out and get more information, that's why they sent me here, okay? Uh, but it's really been a joy for me to be here, and I'd like to, to offer a word of prayer before our praise team comes back up. Is that the way, that's the way we've done it, right? Thank you guys very much for your listening. Father God, thank you uh, in the name of Jesus uh, that our names uh, are written in your book of life, that we have eternal life if we have placed our hope and our trust and our faith in the work and person of Jesus and nothing more and nothing less. Father, I would pray that if there's someone here this morning that maybe hasn't done that or is curious about how to do that, I pray that they would not leave this building without coming and seeing the pastor or the staff or, or maybe a Sunday school teacher they know or even myself, Father, uh, and that they would not leave this room without uh, knowing that their name is in your book of life. Father, I thank you for this church, this congregation that is uh, vibrant and healthy, that preaches your word and sings about Jesus Father, unashamedly, and I would ask that you would bless them and keep them and cause your face to shine upon them. I would ask that you would be gracious to them and give them peace. Let us always, always live for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.